Who is that just name? You guys will give me your attention. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, at 7 o'clock, we want to make sure we give all our speakers plenty of time and don't run into their time. And so, um, the first thing I want to do is welcome you. We're so glad you're all here. Hope you enjoyed the, the meal. It's good to interact with um, people during the meal. And we want to recognize that this is our 16th year for the lecture series. Can you believe that? 16 Februarys. That's almost a year and a half of Februarys. That's a lot of speakers, that's a lot of discussions and a lot of questions and answers and stuff. And, it, and if you've ever been to one in the past, or you've enjoyed one in the last couple of weeks, you, you have some people to thank, or we have some people to thank that are here tonight. We have four sponsors that are going to be sharing tonight, right? Four, four, four. four different sponsors that are going to be sharing tonight. And I don't mean, I know for some of you, like me, sponsoring means a person. These are actual like financial sponsors. And so, um, they're going to be coming to talk tonight, and I don't mean to be depressing, but uh, I will. Uh, I will say this: I am tired of losing family and friends to addiction. And um, uh, I lost a friend a couple weeks ago, and have uh, lots of lost a lot in the past. Um, I'm very fortunate to be in recovery myself, and, and the organizations that are going to be sharing tonight. They're on the front lines of saving lives when it comes to addiction, and helping families, and so um, these are like the, the heroes that you don't get to see very often. And speaking of heroes you don't get to see very often, um, there was a, a, a famous economist one time who said the real work in every economy takes place in the shadows. It's mothers taking care of children and people doing jobs that don't get recorded, and it happens in the shadows or no one sees it. Well, Casey King is the director and the, 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 the hands behind the curtain that does all the shadow work to make this happen every year. And uh, Casey was the, the one who came up with the idea. He was the founder. He's the director. He, he runs the speaker series all 16 years. And um, he usually starts, I usually get a phone call from him sometime in May or June where he's already starting to contact speakers to see who could get lined up. And every year he tries to get a different type of speaker for, for each week. We have, usually have a celebrity speaker. If you were here a couple weeks ago, you got to hear Todd, uh, Todd Bridges. Uh, Todd shared. Then last week we had the medical uh, side of it uh, with Dr. Kevin McCauley. And this week we get the on-the-ground local version of it. We get, we get the local people who are doing the re addiction, addiction recovery work. They're here. And next week we're going to get um, students and, and a faculty member sharing their story, and so it's an, a, even another version of this. But Casey's been doing this work for 16 years. I mean, that's an enormous amount of time. That's an enormous amount of people who have gotten to hear about addiction recovery from all those different angles, and, and, and that shadow work gets uh, not seen. And so I just want to take a moment to honor Casey and thank him and thank the sponsors. And so if you'll, you'll uh, join me in thanking them, I'm going to welcome him to the podium while you're clapping. So. My name's Casey. I'm a person in long-term recovery. It means I haven't had a drink or a drug since September 15, 2005. Wow. When I started this event in 2008, there was no funding available. I was a person in short-term recovery then. So for a person in short-term recovery to start something like this, there's not a whole lot of credibility that comes with that person. So when I, when I started this in 2008, it was all local speakers. And some of you were here in the early years, but there was no funding and there was all local speakers. Over the past several years, this event has attracted speakers such as Lou Gossett Jr., Danny Trejo, which was the largest on-campus event in our college's history. <laughs> this auditorium was full plus six classrooms, and we managed it. 750 people showed up for Danny Trejo. It's not free. <clears throat> so over the years, the college supports me. I appreciate student activities. That makes a major contribution. But also I'd like to acknowledge Faber Peer Connection in Conway, Lighthouse Behavioral Health Hospital, Shoreline Behavioral Services, and Grand Strand Health. Let's give them a round of applause. This really is a we event, and it's there's and the people who volunteer to serve the food, and they're all volunteers. Uh, it, it keeps it free for us to do, and this is a way to give something back to the recovery community. I appreciate you all. 
Our first speaker tonight comes from Shoreline Behavioral Services. She's here to tell you her personal story of addiction and recovery. Please welcome Sarah Johnson. My name is Sarah Johnson and I work at Shoreline Behavioral Health Services and I am actually a certified peer support specialist. Oh, okay. You take my shoes off. Everyone knows I have to be grounded, like, you know, feeling something under my feet. I'm, so I am also a person in long-term recovery. I'm, I have actually, so, my clean date is January 10th, 2015. So I have a little over eight years in recovery and I'm, I started working as a certified peer support specialist two years ago for Shoreline. And I'm, I'm really grateful. Like I do something every day that um, is unmatched to anything I've ever done in my life. And um, I'm really grateful for Shoreline. But um, so I'm just gonna kinda I guess tell you all my story and tell you what how I got here and I'm why I'm in front of you today talking to you about addiction and um, so I was born in Charleston South Carolina uh, which is about two hours from here and um, I was born into a pretty prominent family there I'm um, and I had a I had a pretty good childhood like no no craziness went on I'm my parents got divorced that was pretty much all the trauma that I had and I'm um, I was very very fortunate and I'm um, so I I just spoke like I just spoke last week and for some reason I'm a little bit more nervous today than I am last week which but there was like a hundred people in the room and um, so it's kind of odd that I'm, I'm a little bit more nervous tonight um, but anyway, so I grew up in Charleston, and I'm, I was a really great student. Um, I actually graduated sixth in my class from high school. I went on to college, um, all the good things, but I'm, from a very young age, like, I started overeating really bad. And um, I always say, like, we like to think sometimes that um, children have addict-like behaviors, but in reality, addicts have children-like behaviors. Um, like because we are we are children usually stuck in adult bodies and um, and all we want is that little girl so to be nourished and that's really what I wanted my whole life I'm um, so when I started to overeat I'm um, I got really criticized for it i um, through my mom and I'm um, because like my the whole thing is that like when you're from a really good family and you're from like a whatever like that perception is really really big for them and and so like that perception of perfectionism and like i still have a disease of perfectionism today um you know i love to try to be perfect i love it um you know because i can always set myself up for failure and um and so i started using drugs at the age of 13. i'm I, I was pretty much a anything if you if you're gonna offer it to me I'm gonna try it I'm gonna try everything once and I'm probably gonna do a lot of it you know I um, I really didn't find my drug of choice until uh, I was about 19 and I'm um, so I was in college and I partied a lot in college I was failing out for like the third time and I'm um, and I just I, I just started using and I started using so much that my disease just kind of took over and no longer my life could be manageable and I'm so around that time I had turned 20 and i my boyfriend died he died in a car accident and I went off the deep end and I'm I, I hid hid pretty much for 28 days I'm um, just using drugs and someone came and found me and they actually brought me to the lighthouse so thank you lighthouse for being here um, but they brought me to the lighthouse and I went into Wilmington Treatment Center and um, I actually lived in recovery I got clean through Wilmington Treatment Center and um, I lived in recovery in a 12-step program for two and a half years 
And because I was so young in recovery, I did not understand really what the disease of addiction was. I didn't really take the time. Um, you know, and, and so I, you know, I, I convinced myself that I was normal, that it was just a thing. You know, I started drinking, um, having a glass of wine with dinner, really. And um, one night I decided to pick up my drug of choice because why not? I can manage drinking, I can manage smoking pot, I can, I can definitely manage smoking some crack, you know, whatever, whatever I have to do. And, um, and unfortunately I could not manage that. And uh, so I went off the deep end once again and my disease really rubbed up from there. Um, I, you know, as I went on, through my disease and I and I got out of recovery and like that transition from going from knowing what I should do and go back to people who love me and not wanting to at the same time because I love doing drugs it gave me a sense of freedom was like really hard for me at, at that time because like that transition from recovery into active addiction once again was um like I had a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, a lot of things, and, but it gave me some really good excuses to use. It gave me so many good excuses to use, you know? And, um, and so as I got deeper and farther, I actually found out what the real world was about. And um, I became homeless really quick. I lost my car really quick. I lost my really good job that I had in recovery really quick. I lost everything. And I'm, I was working at a golf resort and I, I met a man and he convinced me to fly with him to Texas. And um, I was like, Psh, I have nothing to lose. Like, I, yes, I will get on a plane with a, you know, fancy golfer and go to Texas. Why not? I'm a drug addict, you know? Wow. Uh, like, I have nothing to lose. And I, uh, I didn't realize that I had everything to lose. Um, I had my life and that's really like, I, I did not value my life any longer at all. And um, so I later on, I found out what this actually means is that when someone convinces you to get on an airplane and when you get there, they end up pimping you out and they end up pumping drugs through you and um, you know, like at first, I was actually telling someone today, um, at first I thought it was really awesome. Like I was getting everything I wanted, you know? I was getting to live in a hotel. I was, you know, getting my meals for free. I was getting all this stuff. I, I actually worked in a strip club with it for him. Like all these things. And um, like, I didn't realize what actually was going on. And um, as the, the hole started to, dig and you know like we just keep on digging our hole we keep on digging our hole and um as it just i just kept on digging and i realized that i was actually human trafficked because i wanted to leave and i could no longer leave um i could no longer i had an out i did not have an out um i could no longer go anywhere i wanted to go i could no longer do the things i wanted to do i could no longer pretty much even pee without someone knowing that i was in the bathroom peeing you know um, I had to ask permission for everything. Um, and, and when you get to that point, like, um, and you don't see a way out, the only way is to use drugs. The only way to leave, for me, I thought, was to use drugs. Because at least if I was using drugs, I was escaping. You know, I was escaping in my mind. And so I started using there really, really hard. And I'm... You know, I'm not going to go all into it because it was a really horrid time. Um, it was hell. I literally, I, I always say, I actually know what the depths of hell is, and it's in Texas, you know. Um, so uh, some time went by, some things happened, and um, I was really, really fortunate. My dad hired a private investigator, and they found me. And they got me out of Texas. And I'm um, like, I am so fortunate today because I, I actually carry still to this, 
I try not to. I've, I've been to so many counseling sessions. I've been to EDMR, EDMR, everything. But I still carry a guilt that, like, I got out, you know? And, like, all my friends didn't. Um, all the girls that I was with never did. And so, like, I, I still carry that, that guilt till still today. And I try not to, but, like, you know, seeing people's faces who want to leave and they know you get to leave and they don't is something really big. And that affected me a lot when I got home on, um, you think that like when someone comes and saves you, like you should stop using, like, you know, and, and this is the thing, and this is what I always try is that like some of us may be addicts in this room or some of us may be people in long-term recovery, but most of us know someone who is either in active addiction right now or who is in recovery right now. All of us do. Whether it's a family member, whether it's a friend, all of us know someone. And so just think of that love that we feel for those people and for us and for ourselves, like now that we're in recovery, but like all of that pain that goes with it too, you know? And so I, I left and um, I couldn't really look at myself any longer. I didn't, I couldn't process the things that I needed to process. And so I didn't get clean. Um, my dad thought I would and I didn't. And like, um, you know, every day I'm really grateful now. I have an amazing relationship with my father. And um, like, I remember when I first got clean, I'm like, sorry, dad, I didn't get clean when I got home from Texas. And, you know, uh, he would say it's okay. But like, I, would, I know that pain, just like all of us know that pain of like, when we really want someone to get clean and we try to do everything in our power for them to get clean and then they just don't, you know? And, um, and it, it has no reflection on us because like the hope is still here. Like I'm standing right here. So the hope is here, you know, I am clean today. So the hope is here. And, um, like, that's the most amazing part is that like, so all these people that we know, you know, we continue to do things to try to save them or continue to support them. And like, maybe one day they'll get it. That's the hope, you know? And um, so anyways, kind of got off a tangent on that. And, um, but as I went on using, um, so I kind of left this part out because I was trying to make it a little bit different than last week when I spoke. Uh, and, but when I was 16 years old, um, I went to a specialty doctor and um, I have PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and they told me that my PCOS, PCOS was so bad that I was never gonna be able to have children. They told me pretty much, you know what, suck it up, buttercup. Um, they weren't very nice about it, and telling a 16-year-old that she's never gonna have children is pretty, pretty horrible, you know what I mean? And um, I was devastated at that time. And I was actually devastated for a lot of years, but then I kind of came to this weird acceptance that like it was always just gonna be me. And I think that for a long time that like I just continued to use because I never really thought that I was gonna have a family. I never thought that I was like really achievable. Like I never thought that like any guy was gonna want me because like I couldn't have a family with him. And like, so like that, that thing that like, you know, kind of our, our community uplifts of like family and this and that. Like I never really thought I was going to have that. So it didn't really bother me anymore. But um, I, I have been to jail way more times than I can count. And um, in the last time that I was in jail, I walked in and um, it was for six separate charges and I thought I was definitely going to go away. And um, I knew no one was gonna come bail me out. My parents were over bailing me out. No one I knew really would ever bail me out. Um, at that point in time, I was homeless. Um, I lived in and out of really bad motels. Um, you know, I always say, when I walked into a gas station, you knew that I was an addict. You know what I mean? Like when you know, and um, I was at that point, I was, I you know, didn't wear shoes because I didn't have shoes, you know? Um, and so I went to jail and I was in there and they said, do you want to take a pregnancy test? And I knew that it was going to be like 10 minutes that I didn't have to go 
be in like cell, the cell blocks. I was like, yeah, give me a pregnancy test. Why not? Like, I'll get 10 more minutes out here. And, uh, and then I was like, you know, thinking in my head, just maybe it'll come out like false positive and I'll get those peanut butter sandwiches, you know, instead of like the nasty, uh, like these are the things that are going through my head. Like maybe I'll get two mats instead of one. You know what I mean? And um, so I'm, I'm in jail and I'm waiting on my pregnancy test and I'm, you know, I laughed because I was like, this is never going to happen. You know, this is never going to happen. And I'm, the PO walks around and she's like, Johnson, I need, you know, no, you need to come, you need to come pee again. And I'm like, okay, I, yeah, I'll go pee again. It's 10 more minutes. You know what I mean? And I'm um, in the pregnancy test came up positive, not one, not two, but three of them. And I'm um, so she's like, well, I guess you get a peanut butter sandwich tonight. And I remember like thinking all of a sudden, like, this is not life, you know, like this is not just happened to me. And um, all of a sudden those fears set in like, I'm a crackhead at this point. Like my whole day revolves around smoking crack and, and, and using and getting more no matter what. And I'm, and so I remember lying in bed and I remember saying like, I'm not going to tell anybody. Like, I'm just not going to tell anybody. And I'm, and then I called my mom and my mom didn't believe me. <laughs> and, uh, and like a week goes by and, um, she ended up getting me out of jail because then like it kind of hit her too. And um, I was ready to change. Like I was ready to do something different. I really was. Um, and so when I got out of jail, I went to a woman's recovery house that used to be really popular here in the Horry County, um, in Horry County. And I'm so grateful still to this day for this recovery house. It really planted the seeds in me once again to start recovering I, and I got clean through a 12 step program. And so like, I'm gonna be really honest. While I was pregnant, I didn't know if I was actually wanting to stay clean. I didn't know if I want to, wanted to. But what I wanted more than anything was for the child inside of me to have a chance at life. And so I thought that that was more important. And by the way, when I found out I was pregnant, I didn't know this until I went to the doctor, but I was actually 14 weeks pregnant. So I wasn't just a little pregnant. I was, I was a pretty pregnant. And, um, you know, so I, I, um, I found like, I just didn't know though, if I wanted to stay clean, but I knew I wanted to give him a chance. And, um, and so, as I stayed clean a little bit longer, and then as I had him, um, something started to shift, but something started to shift really because I started to put the work into it. Um, I started to hang out with a lot of people. I started to open up again. I started to really try to do a little bit better every single day. Um, and so I love, um, the person that I work with, um, and I mentioned this last time I shared, is that um, he always says, like, do you deserve happiness? Do you think you deserve happiness? This is what he asks our clients. And um, I did not think I deserved happiness when I was using. But as I stayed clean, I started to think that I deserved happiness. And I'm um, so, as I stay clean today, like I know today that I deserve happiness. I know that like I deserve that hope. I know that I deserve that faith. I know that I deserve that empathy. And so like what Shoreline bring, affords me the opportunity is to tell everyone every single day that they matter. To tell someone every single day that no matter what, they can get clean. No matter what, I'm, um, things are possible in life. 
you know, um, recovery has been really good to me. Before I was um, working at Shoreline, I, I owned a pretty successful business. I was able to sell it. I was able to do now what I, you know, I love doing. Um, I didn't really think ever I was going to work in the recovery community because um, I thought, so this is what I always thought. I'm like, oh, everyone who gets clean always wants to work at rehabs. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. Everyone who gets clean always wants to work in rehabs. I want to be different. And like as time went on, and um, I have worked other and done other things in the community, I'm like, man, this really is for me. You know, I get to walk into into work every single day and tell someone that they matter. And like no one, maybe that day, that week, that you know, months, that year, for years, have ever told them that they mattered. And like, how amazing is that? Um, you know, like we really are building that hope in the community and I'm really grateful for the opportunity that they afford me. And um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity that they afford their clients too and that I get to be a part of that. Um, and you know, like recovery for me is a lot of things, but like ultimately, Recovery for me is just the freedom, like the freedom that I feel every single day that I can stand here and be afforded to, to speak in front of you. The freedom that I have actually not one but two children now, um, you know, which is so amazing. The freedom I have for a family that I get to do, you know, ultimately whatever I would want to do. Um, and so with that, I will close and I'm um, think that I was on time ish yeah okay and uh, so is there any questions <laughs> all right well I will pass it on to Casey thank you very much again and hope you all have a great night thank you Sarah thank you Dr. Causey before we, start, before we start the second half, I want to remind you that the series concludes next week. There's a fourth night. On the fourth night, it's a panel of students, faculty, and staff in recovery. You're going to hear six different stories, and they're varied in their addictions. They're also varied in their recovery. Would anyone who's spoken on a previous student panel raise your hand who's here tonight? Would anyone? Would anyone who's speaking next week raise their hand? One. Anybody else? Okay. So, Dr. Fondren is a faculty member at Coastal Carolina University, and he's going to be part of that student panel next week. I hope you all come back. Our third speaker tonight is from Grand Strand Health. <clears throat> Grand Strand Health is a multi facility health system located on the coast of Grand Strand Community. I'm sure you're aware of their presence. I'd like to welcome to the stage Chris Fern, the Director of Behavioral Health Programs, to tell us a little bit about mental health addiction. at Grand Strand Medical Center. We're located at the South Strand campus. Um, we have lots of flyers and all that, so I won't bore you with all of that dry detail right now. Um, also with me is uh, Christy Beck. She is our, our interim nurse manager. Um, so we will have some time for a few questions at the end. So if you have any uh, medical focus questions, I've got my medical person here to help you. So, like you said, I'm going to talk about mental health and addiction. Um, the main reason that I wanted to talk about that... <coughs> okay, it wasn't just you guys. <laughs> the main reason that I wanted to talk about um, mental health and addiction is because they, they play a role hand in hand. Um, we'll get into some stats, but the majority of our patients that we get at Grand Strand who are there for mental health issues also have substance abuse issues. 
um, what we call that when someone has been diagnosed both with a substance abuse disorder and a mental health disorder is dual diagnosis. Um, it makes, makes sense, dual diagnosis, you have two diagnoses that are um, playing off of each other. Um, the key is that we have to treat both of them. We can't just treat one, we have to treat both. Um, another way, another way you might hear about dual diagnosis is um, it, having it, it be being referred to as a co-occurring disorder. Um, that's just another way of saying dual diagnosis is again, you have two disorders that are working together. Um, comorbid, comorbidity is another term also um, used to describe it. Um, it also means that the interaction between the two disorders can worsen the course of both. Um, you know, the doctor just spoke about how life is hard. And so what often happens with people who have mental illness, um, they end up looking for a way to try to fix that. And then that leads to substance abuse disorder. Um, then, you know, just like what has been shared, often people have a substance abuse disorder that leads to depression, anxiety, and other things. Um, so for statistics, who's affected? 77.7 million adults have co-occurring mental and substance abuse disorders. Now, this doesn't mean necessarily that one caused the other, um, and it can be difficult to determine which came first. It really doesn't matter which came first because they both have to be treated. Of the 20.3 million adults with substance abuse disorders, 37.9 also had mental illnesses. And then among the 42.1 million adults with mental illness, 18.2 also had substance abuse disorders. And I would also say that that statistic is much higher than what is reported because again, we, have, we get a lot of patients that come in that also have substance abuse disorders that they don't, that they don't report. Um, if it's not their primary reason for being there, we may not know about it. So. Um, I would say that that statistic is actually higher. Um, so some, I was actually planning to read off of this slide, so I'm just gonna pop around this corner here. All right, so common mental health disorders that you see in combination, anxiety, depression, PTSD, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and personality disorders. And then the statistics that I really want to point out is who is most at risk for develop, development of a dual diagnosis. Statistically men, especially between ages 25 to 50. Those of a lower socioeconomic status. Those with other general medical illnesses. And then our veterans. Um, you know, we talk about PTSD, anxiety, depression. Um, especially with PTSD, people think veterans first because that's usually where you hear it the most because those people have experienced combat um, a lot of situations that we would never experience in real life but t PTSD can be so um, it, it's it's so prevalent you know throughout the general population um, any kind of incident that happens in your life can cause PTSD and um, it shows up in the form of dual diagnosis just as prevalent in our military community as it does here. Um, but again, part of that treatment, we have to treat both. And then it also um, is very helpful if when we're doing that, we can figure out what caused or what were the triggers so that um, we can give those people the, the support that they need from people that's been through it. How's dual diagnosis determined? So with any mental illness, um, that's gonna take a, um, an assessment done by a physician or a licensed therapist. Um, they're gonna look at symptoms. They're gonna you know, see you know, how that is affecting their life. And I'd say that that's how they determine substance abuse disorder. Is it something that is profoundly affecting your life in a negative way? It, it, you figure both of those out pretty similar. So then um, one of the terms I really want to talk about is what is self-medicating? Um, that's something that we hear a lot with dual diagnosis. 
somebody has a mental illness or they're dealing with symptoms of PTSD, anxiety, depression, etc. They don't know what to do about it. They're afraid to ask for help. They don't want to get stigmatized for going to the psych hospital. Um, so what do they do? They turn to something that can alleviate their symptoms. And what often that ends up being is substance abuse. And so what self-medicating is, by definition, is using um, any kind of substance or it really, like we were talking about with technology, using anything um, to help alleviate symptoms that doesn't actually take care of the illness, but it masks those symptoms. So, sorry, I'm kind of lost here. All right. Um, so again, um, this can be, it can be drugs and alcohol. Um, it can be pain medications. It can be, you know, anything that you might use to help alleviate those symptoms. Um, the big thing is, is that, you know, it's often without the guidance of a doctor. So, um, you know, misusing medications that might have been prescribed for something else, those are all examples of self-medicating. Um, oftentimes people self-medicate just as a response to the pressures of life. How many times do you hear somebody at the end of the day going, I'm going to go home and crack a beer? You know, that's self-medicating. We joke about it, but that's self-medicating. So some signs to look for of people who might be self-medicating. Staying away from family, friends, social events, or other activities. A sudden change in hobbies or who somebody spends time with. Secrecy about how they spend their time. Neglecting their physical care, such as showering or eating. Having sudden difficulties at work, school, and other areas. And when I say sudden difficulties, you know, oftentimes, you know, it may suddenly appear sudden, but then when you look back over time, actually the signs were there, and then, you know, something happens to kind of trigger everybody, and then they go, oh, yeah, we weren't paying attention. Um, mood swings, and then new or unusual financial problems because of the cost of alcohol and drugs. So what are the consequences? of having untreated dual diagnosis, overall poor functioning, poor health, and you know that's manifested, it can be in physical illnesses, it can be exacerbation of symptoms of mental illness, um, frequent hospitalization. You, you, you jokingly mentioned you know, being in and out of hospitals, it's a very real thing. Um, when we're not treating the symptoms, the cycle repeats. They come, they come back to us repeatedly. Um, downward drift. So that is a term um, for basically an overall decline in your life, your functioning. You lose a job, um, you can lose your car, you can lose your house. Um, oftentimes what happens is people end up living in, you know, marginal neighborhoods that they wouldn't have been to before. Um, they're going to put themselves in places where drug use prevails. Um, they're going to not be in the same social situations or areas where they were before, maybe out of embarrassment. Um, and then, of course, when you're dealing with all these other things, it's really hard to develop healthy social relationships. So then what happens? They surround themselves with people who are doing the same things as them. And then the cycle continues. Um, oh, also, we mentioned incarceration and then difficult with, difficulty with and for the family. Um, you know, something you'll hear a lot with uh, substance abuse is that, you know, it, it is a disease, it is a personal disease, but it also is a family disease. For family members and friends that love that person and care for that person, it affects them profoundly as well. It's the same thing with mental illness. Um, you know, mental illness obviously is something that the individual experiences, but the whole family experiences it as well. Um, so who gets treatment? This little graphic here. Um, so basically not everyone with a co-occurring condition gets the treatment they need. Um, unfortunately, 52.5% receive neither mental health nor substance abuse treatment. 
That's over half of people who are experiencing co-occurring disorders. 34.5% received mental health care only. 9.1 received both mental health care and substance abuse treatment, and then 3.9 received substance abuse treatment only. So I started this off by saying that people with co-occurring disorders have to treat both illnesses in order to fully recover. And right now we're looking at 9.1% of people actually doing that. That's a horrific statistic. Is, is alcohol in the uh, 3.9? So receive substance abuse treatment only? Yes, that's alcohol, any kind of drug use. Mm -hmm. And this was pulled from the Nats National Institute of Drug Abuse. If you look on their website, they have, they have statistics on all kinds of things. I learned a lot this week pulling this data up. Okay. So what are the barriers to getting treatment? What keeps people from seeking out that treatment? Number one, they don't know where to go. You know, if you've never been involved in the mental health or the substance abuse community, you don't know where to start. Um, you know, that's why it's so important for events like this um, and ones like it just to get the word out that, hey, we're here. If you ever need us, then here's where you go because it's one of those things that if you don't need it, you never look for it. And then when you do need it, you don't know where it is. Mommy, of course, lots of people don't think they need treatment. There's also a fear of being committed. And when I say committed, um, that means like committed to a hospital. Um, people who have experienced being committed to a hospital before will do anything to keep from being committed again, including lying um, to their health care providers. Um, of, of course, judgment from others. They don't think it will help. They don't have the time. You know, maybe, you know, they still are high enough functioning that they have a job or a family. I don't, I don't have time to take care of that. It, it's all right. Um, fear of confidentiality. You know, people don't want their business to get out there. And so they're afraid that if they seek treatment, I mean, I hear this about South Strand. Everybody knows that South Strand is where the behavioral health unit is. There's other things there too. We have wound care and all those kind of things. But some people are afraid to be seen on the back side of the building because that's where behavioral health is. It's that stigma. Um, as mentioned earlier, not ready to stop using. They don't have health insurance. They're worried about the cost. I put fear of judgment again by accident, but it's probably one of the biggest things. And then if they have a job, fear of losing it. You know, um, we, we have an EAP program at Grand Strand. I know a lot of organizations do. I've had staff tell me that they're scared to reach out to it because they don't want it to get back to us that they're having issues. You know, that goes right with the confidentiality and all of those things. Um, if there is someone that's struggling, that's one of the things that we really want to, you know, hit home with them is that, you know, this is not something that is anybody's business but yours. And we're just here to support you along the way. And if your employers are, you know, not that way, have them reach out to me and I'll tell them how to do it better. <laughs> so how do we treat it? We use integrated treatment. So obviously the first thing that needs to happen is detox. If your body is not functioning well, your mind is not functioning well, other kind of treatment isn't going to be helpful. I know we talked about it, prescribed medications, but I will say as someone who's worked in mental health for years and years and years, when taken properly, medication works. It's a life changer. Uh, but again, taking it as prescribed, no alterations. Don't mix it with things you shouldn't. Big thing, behavioral therapies. Um, that can be inpatient treatment, outpatient treatment, long-term residential, group or individual, and then uh, CBT, DBT, motivational interviewing. So what CBT is, that's cognitive behavioral therapy. It's one of the most widely used therapies for addiction and for mental illness. It focuses on changing a person's thoughts and behaviors. It teaches the person techniques to cope with their situation. And it can, it can like I said, can be used for um, both substance abuse and mental illness. 
So basically what CBT is, is it's retraining your brain on how to think and how to process things so that your first instincts are not those old habits. Um, DBT is dialectical behavior therapy. It focuses on self-acceptance, mindfulness, and teaches the person how to regulate their emotions. Why do people often use? They're trying to regulate their emotions. DBT helps teach the person how to retrain their brain on how to regulate their emotions. And then motivational interviewing, it's a wild, widely used type of therapy for cases of dual diagnosis. It seeks to support and encourage the person in a positive, non-judgmental way, and it helps the person become adjusted and ready to face recovery. So it, instead of the typical, you know, think Fraser Crane, you know, sitting in the chair, I guess he was on the radio, so that's a bad example. But, you know, your psychiatrist sitting in the chair, you're laying back, doing the things. What motivational interviewing is, is it's a conversation. So these therapists are trained on how to, through conversation, help you to open up and not only to share with them what your needs are, but also start to share those things with yourself. So prognosis. I mean, as demonstrated by the people in this room, when you take the steps to treat your mental illness and your substance abuse, prognosis is excellent. But again, you know, it's, it's a one day at a time thing. I, I, could, I could just repeat everything that's been said so far because they all said it so well. But if, you, if someone does have a dual diagnosis, they must treat both and they must continue to treat both for the rest of their lives. Um, mental illness, just like you know, she was saying earlier, mental illness is a disease and it is something that's manageable. But again, you know, if you take the steps, you follow your treatment plans, you listen to your doctors, you listen to your therapist, and most importantly, if you reach out when you're struggling, prognosis is excellent. That's the biggest thing is what, it is okay to struggle but you must reach out. There's so many resources available. Um, so, so some of the resources, you know, we've got you know three tables sitting out in the hallway of some excellent resources. I of course want to talk a little bit about our own, um, our inpatient program. We have a 22 bed inpatient unit, and it is specifically for people who are in a mental health crisis. So a great example is someone who, you know, maybe they got drunk, um, they told their family member, I want to die, they ended up in the ED, no. then they would end up getting a referral to us. We have an excellent intake department that's there 24 hours a day. Um, it's on every single one of my pamphlets out in the hallway, so please grab at least one of them on your way out the door. Um, but what we do is we assess, um, see what the issues are, and um, if somebody is in a situation where they aren't safe to go home, aren't safe to be in the community, they can come um, to our inpatient unit. We also have uh, two intensive outpatient programs. One is a partial hospitalization program. Um, oftentimes people step down from inpatient to the partial hospitalization, but the, a lot of people just um, come and they get a, they ask for an assessment and we refer them straight to outpatient because they're not in a place where they need to you know, be out of their home, um, but they are in a place where they do need some intensive treatment. So our partial hospitalization is uh, six hours of therapy a day. Um, it's mostly groups, but you do um, see our psychiatrist once a week and then there is individual sessions available. And then our intensive outpatient program, IOP, that's a half day. Sometimes it's in the morning, sometimes it's in the evening. Um, it's a favorite of people who have jobs or kids or things that they have to work around. Um, you come, you get your therapy, and then you go home in the evening. So um, if there is anybody in your life that you feel like could benefit from these services, um, please, like I said, take one of our flyers. You call our intake department. They'll do an assessment and we'll refer you to the best level of care. Now, what we don't do um, is detox. 
um, but we do partner with those in the community that do. So if you call our intake and there's something that you need that we don't offer, we will refer you to our partners. We will make sure that you get to the place that you need to go. So with all that being said, um, does anyone have any questions that I can answer about dual diagnosis or the programs? Yes. I have a question, but how many beds do you have? 22. 22. Mm -hmm. Currently, we're looking to expand. Yeah. Do you have a 24 hour, you said you have someone on staff 24 hours, that would be in the ER? So um, we, we are actually in the same building as South Strand ER. But our intake department, it's its own department, and there's someone staffed there 24 hours a day. And do you have, do you have a hotline? Um, like so are you thinking just like a suicide hotline? Well, not just that, but uh, right, a crisis mm -hmm. So our intake department, they will take those calls, absolutely. But if it's, some, if it's something where somebody is just, you know, wanting to talk to somebody, we'll refer them to um, one of the, the um, other hotlines. But think of it as, you've heard of the 988? Have you heard of that? Okay, well it's like the 911 for mental health. So if you call 988, it will connect you to a crisis worker anywhere in the country, no matter where you are, if that's what it'll connect you to. So our intake, they will they will do that as well. But if somebody's looking, you know, for like a long term, you know, kind of conversation, what they'll do is they'll connect them with resources. Thank you. Now, you said, how do you determine a person's diagnosis? I mean, nine out of ten of the symptoms you put up there are alcoholic or addict or have. You can put somebody on Prozac and, and, and don't need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's important that we get the history of the individual, both relevant to what their mental illness might be and what their substance abuse disorder might be. That's a great point because most of the symptoms are, they, they play completely together. And that's something that our psychiatrists are well educated in, is if somebody has a history of substance abuse, there's certain medications that they wouldn't prescribe. And oftentimes, just getting someone clean from those substances is the first step to treating that mental illness. They may not need medications. Not everybody does. And I think that's, um, that's something that people don't realize too, is just because you have a mental illness, that doesn't necessarily mean you need medication. Some people are able to manage it in other ways. Healthy coping skills. Just more of a comment uh, question. I enjoyed your talk. Um, I think that was odd how I fit three out of the four categories of the dual diagnosis. But I went through, I call it the VAL program, the AEIOP program. Atlanta. I got out and I saw a psychiatrist for a while and they went to prescribe medication and I would ask them is my depression causing my alcohol and drugs or is my alcohol and drugs causing my depression and he said why don't you stop doing alcohol and drugs for a while. Thanks. If you have a question if you raise your hand I'll bring the microphone and hold it up as you speak into it so everybody can hear you. Anybody else have a question? that have no insurance how do we work with them the exact same way we work with patients that have insurance uh, it every situation is different um, you know there are some resources available um, for you know what we would call a, a charity case um, but again every situation is different but you know like any hospital anyone who needs the help is going to get it Okay. <laughs> I thought you were just flashing me the peace sign. <laughs> All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I just want to thank everyone for having me. And I want to thank the people who spoke before me. Um, people thank me a lot for what I do, but 
I think it's even more important to thank those people because you've lived it. I work with it, but you've lived it, and thank you. Our final speakers tonight are from the Lighthouse Care Center. So Kathy Buell and Bathsheba Sherman, I think, spoke last year on Zoom. But tonight they're going to speak in person. And the topic is going to be medically assisted treatment, and I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Please welcome Kathy Buell and Bathsheba Sherman. By Sheba Sherman. I am a therapist. Um, I currently work at The Beacon. We are a um, outpatient provider services for individuals who are dealing with um, addiction as well as mental health issues. Before I get started, I do want to take this opportunity. Um, it's not often that you're able to really be able to um, pay homage to the individuals that have paved the way for you. And I wanted to take this time to give the person that has done a lot in my career her flowers. So I just want us to tell Miss Kathy how much I appreciate it or appreciate all the time that I've had to watch you, to learn from you, and to be able to do this job that I do. And feel so passionate about what I do every day. So I just want to thank you for all you do. Okay, so we're going to speak tonight about medication assistant treatment. Um, so what is medication assistant treatment? It is treatment that or medications that we give to individuals who are dealing with addiction issues to help them begin the process of recovery, um, as well as begin to regain some element of control over their lives. Now, these medications can be used for mental as well, I mean medical as well as mental health issues. But tonight we're going to address those ones that are specifically associated with um, addiction and recovery. So you might be asking yourself, well, why are these medications necessary for individuals who are in recovery? Well, oh, I forgot to turn this. <coughs> Sorry. Um, these medications are necessary because not everybody in recovery recovers at the same rate or under the same condition. Um, we have individuals who may need treatment and they want to get into an inpatient facility but can't because they don't meet the criteria or they may not have the funding. So when they're able to get these treatments on an outpatient basis, it gives them that opportunity to get the treatment they need and possibly get it at a um, cheaper rate. These medications also help individuals who are um, dealing or who may have issues such as other medical conditions that may be associated with addiction so they can help prevent some of those issues. A lot of times, as you know, in addiction, we're always 
using. And so a lot of times those symptoms that we're having may be masked by the substance that we're using. So these medications, as long as a person is consistent and they're following that treatment, could help prevent some of those issues as well. Um, as well as preventing HIV, um, hepatitis B and C, as we um, heard already tonight, these medications can help because the individual is able to be more consistent with treatment. They are not putting themselves at risk as they would be if they were um, in active addiction. So they can help sustain some of that function back in your life. Um, as we know in early recovery, re relapse rates are high. And so these medications can help reduce some of those rates as individuals are consistent with their treatment, as well as reduce some of the fatalities that we see um, with addiction. The ultimate goal is harm reduction. Um, that's what we're looking to do with medication assistant treatment is reduce harm. We wanna keep people safe and we wanna save lives. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kathy Buell, and I work at the Beacon with my Sheba, and I'm very happy to be here and talk about something I think is very difficult. I've been blessed to be in recovery um, since July 13, 1987, and I know I, I don't look, you know, I'm, I'm very young. <laughs> and, uh, and I've been blessed to be in the field since 1989. And um, yes, and I was one of those who joined this because I was in recovery. I, I don't see Sarah here right now, but yes, everybody wants to work in recovery. I know I did. Um, because I wanted to give back what was given to me and, and if I could possibly do so and, and I've been blessed to be able to do that. So one of the things that we talked about today and, and Ashiva and I did speak last year and we enjoyed that but we figured what, what topic do we want to cover? What do we want to talk about in recovery? And she said she wanted to talk about medication assisted treatment and I said yes, absolutely. So what's the controversy? What's the issue? What's the big deal? You know, why, why are we splitting hairs? You know, if, if a medication can provide some sort of avenue for someone to get well and to stay alive, then, then we shouldn't have a controversy. But we have them because we're human, because we have opinions, because we have thoughts, because some of us are in recovery and have experiences and we think everybody should be the same. If I can do it, you can do it. You know? And we see this, and, and it's all just a lack, I think, of understanding and education about medications, about what we're really trying to accomplish. And I, and I think also, too, about recovery. And so SAMHSA, which is the uh, Substance Abuse Mental Health Agency, did a wonderful job in defining recovery several years back and making it understandable and relatable to any type of recovery. Because recovery is a process, it's not an event. It's a process of <coughs> being well, health and well-being, you know, and self-direction, the ability to make a choice, to make a decision. And so medications have become available that make it easier to do that to stay alive in the process. I mean, I think if anything, I mean, this opioid crisis has brought about the understanding of how much a crisis addiction is overall. You know, when we look at the statistics and it's just, and this was several years ago, that 13 people on average every hour die from the disease of addiction. That's an awful lot of people. That's an awful lot of people. You figure out the math each day, what we're talking about, how many people are losing their lives because they don't have the help they need. <coughs> We're not all the same. We can't all do exactly the same things. We don't all have the same opportunities to get the help we need. So it's really important that these medications are available. We should use them. You know, and, I, and as a member of recovery for a long time, and I, I've been around where people would say things like, you know, why do you need to take medication? We can do it without it. Well, no, not everybody can. And people are dying. <laughs> That's not okay. We can't co-sign that. We must make available things to make people have the ability to get into treatment and recovery. You know? So when, when they redefined recovery, they said it is to include principles. That's what Sam just said, and I said, I, I agree. Hope, very big one, right? Person-driven, have many pathways to recovery. Focus on strengths and responsibility and accountability. Holistic in its approach. Here supported. Of course, we have peer connection here today. We have grants. We have everybody here today because it is peer supported. And you, you know, um, we need to address trauma. 
We need to address the need for respect, for empowerment, which is what Dr. Causey was talking about, and make it understandable, relational, and we need to make it culturally appropriate. And so therefore, knowing that those are the principles, of course it's not gonna be the same for everyone, is it? It's gotta be individualized. So when we start to break down what medications we're talking about, I can see where some of the controversy comes. You know, as I say, I've been in this field, so I've worked in a lot of different aspects of recovery. I have worked in methadone clinics. I have worked with Suboxone. I have worked in drug-free and halfway houses. I've held many different jobs in psychiatric hospitals, inpatient, outpatient, above patient, under patient, <laughs> all over. Okay? And I'm blessed because I've had a lot of opportunities in doing that and a lot of experiences to learn. And a lot of times when I would work with, with clients or patients who would come in and be offered a medication-assisted treatment, some of them resist it. If I take this medication, is it a crutch? If I take this medication, will I become addicted? If I take this medication, am I in recovery? These are the questions we have to answer. So the one, one question I would say for people who are taking methadone or, or uh, buprenorphine or Suboxone, Subutex, if I take this me medication, will I become addicted? No, you already are. And I'd say, if you don't know that, we can't give you this because we're treating your addiction. And it works because it is an opioid. Methadone and buprenorphine are opioids. Two different types, but they're opioids. That's why they work so effectively and so quickly. A lot of people need to understand that before they take the medication. Methadone is a full agonist, which means that it acts very much like our, our natural brain in terms of the endorphins, the neurotransmitters. I don't want to go all into that because it could take hours and hours, and we don't want to do that, and I get sidetracked very easily. I'm like a cat with shiny objects sometimes. So I have still some many issues yet. But, um, but I want to just say that a lot of times people get upset with methadone and, and the, the fact that it is an, an opiate, and that you can feel the full effect of that. You can, yes, get high from methadone. You can. But the purpose in, of the use of it is to treat the addiction. So the idea is that it's prescribed, that you're given a specific dose so you're not experiencing that, and that you get the opportunity, therefore, to stop chasing a drug and begin treatment and recovery. That's the purpose. That was always the purpose. The cons or the, the downsides to using methadone is that it's easily divertible. It can be very challenging for people to go to a clinic where they're oftentimes offered. Methadone is generally pres prescribed through a clinic or some sort of outpatient agency where you must, by state law in most states, attend daily for a certain period of time. Sometimes seven days a week, sometimes six, depending on, again, the state and the clinic can be very challenging to get to these clinics on a daily basis for transportation reasons, financial reasons. So it becomes difficult for the person to be in recovery and to stay in treatment. And that's the downside. It can be costly if, if the clinic does not take your insurance and you have to pay cash. So these are some of the things that make it challenging. You know, and, and so again, there's a stigma attached you know, so we talked about stigma before about walking into to, to a hospital. You know, that's where the, that's where the psych hospital is, or that's where the, you know, it, it never amazes us that you know we, we get stigmatized by somebody might see us coming out of an AA meeting or an NA meeting, but we didn't care if they saw us coming out of the bar or the crack house. <laughs> so, you know, we, we have to weigh these things and we have to kind of help people see through these things because that's the judgmental part of society that we can get through. So when we look at methadone, a lot of people get uh, upset about it or get concerned about it because it is divertible, it can be. We do everything in clinics when you work there to try to make that not happen, but it can happen from time to time. We still don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, though. It may be the only viable treatment someone has, and it may be the one that saves their life. It is a very good medication when properly taken. Again, though, if you can't make the clinic, you can't get there on time, you miss days, you may miss doses, you miss doses, it will relapse. And that's where it becomes challenging. We have buprenorphine, or what we know more popular as Suboxone, which is a trade name. Buprenorphine itself is the opioid, okay? That's a partial agonist, which means that it fills the receptor partially and blocks 
the experience of the high from an opioid. Okay, so if I'm taking buprenorphine and I use on top of that, I'm not going to experience the high that I would normally experience. And the idea being that I'm not going to want to continue to do that because it's not going to be effective. It's not going to work. It also takes away cravings initially and that urge to use. And Dr. McCauley talked about that urge. It is a phenomenon. It is a powerful, powerful brain phenomenon. This isn't a willing willingness on the person's part to want to crave or to want to pick up a drug. This is what happens as a result of having an addiction. So this is a brain issue. It's a brain disorder that has to be treated. So we wanna make sure that we have available treatments for people to do these things. And again, uh, you know, buprenorphine is, uh, most people would know it as suboxone, is a combination of both the uh, buprenorphine and naloxone. I don't wanna say that because it's confused with naltrexone. Naloxone is the medication we also know as Narcan. It sounds interesting, doesn't it, to put an opioid and, and a, a, a medication we use to stop an overdose together. So here's how that works because it gets a little tricky. So the Suboxone works because it has a blocker. Okay, it has the, has the blocker of the partial agonist, the opioid. So if you use on top of that, you won't feel the effects as much. And it has another blocker, Naloxone which also takes away cravings and takes away the uh, effect of an opiate on it. Now, if I'm using an opiate and getting naloxone, I'll go into immediate withdrawal. And that's what we did to people who overdose. And it, takes them, it reverses the effect of the overdose. So it gets a little confusing. Now, Traxone is also a, a blocker as well. It is not an opioid and it is used in the treatment of opioid addiction. We know it as often as Vivitrol. It can be an oral dose or an injectable. And when we give these medications, it again blocks or stops cravings and blocks the effect of use. And so if someone is using Vivitrol and they get an injection, which is probably the, the best way to do it if you can, because you only have to show up once a month, Right? So it eliminates the will, willfulness of ourselves. Right? The addicts don't always want to stay clean every day, <laughs> especially in the beginning. But if I get an injection, it's in there. I got, I got a whole month to work on some issues, okay, hopefully, and, and continue to do what I need to do. If I use the opioid on top of it, I'm not going to feel the full effect. If, however, I'm using an opioid and then get the shot, I'm going to have some uh, withdrawal immediately. So that's why the downside for these medications is you have to have at least a 24 hour period of time of not using an opioid before you can get naltrexone. Okay, because if I give it, get it too soon, I'm gonna get very, very sick. Of course, that's not gonna be very helpful. Okay. So we have to make sure that this is done, obviously in, a, in an office setting or in a professional setting or in a hospital setting. And it, it is good, Dr. McCauley talked about not allowing people to leave the hospital without these doses, which means that they're in a safe environment when they get introduced. We don't like to give Vivitrol in an injectable shot until we know that the person can actually tolerate this medication. So it's often given in an oral form first to make sure that the person can tolerate it, and then if they're able to get the injection. And I say able to, the, the downside to Vivitrol itself, the injection is that it's extraordinarily expensive. Okay. So while it's a once a month shot, and it's, it's excellent in that context, it can range in price to about $1,400, $1,500. And if your insurance doesn't cover it all, you have to pay the remainder, and that can be very, very challenging. Okay. So we look for programs that offer assistance with this, and sometimes in the beginning, they would do it you know, themselves. The Vivitrol, com the company that makes Vivitrol would offer some, some help and give it at least one shot we used to do it at the lighthouse for a little while, and then, then they stopped kind of doing that. So we, oral dosing is much uh, less expensive by all means. It's much, much, it's much, much cheaper, but you have to take that pill. So we have to motivate the individual to want to take the medication. And that can be a little challenging, as we all know. You know it's difficult. It's a day-by-day -day choice that we have to make. But we can only make a choice if we have the ability to stay clean because drug addiction takes away your choice and recovery is about having that back so we want to make sure that we have those medications available to do that um, 
I think for, for most people, uh, Suboxone is not as divertible as methadone. In other words, while we do see it used out on the street from time to time, because it's not a full agonist, you're not going to feel an effect of being high completely off this medication, so it's not something that people necessarily take on the street to get high from. They take it oftentimes to deal with the days they can't get high. It's a little bit different. But, um, and again, diversion isn't that big, as big, or I, I, do, I don't believe it. My opinion is, should it be such an issue when we're talking about saving lives? Okay, when we're talking about saving lives. And that's what we absolutely have to keep the focus on. Keeping people alive to be able to get into recovery you know, and to get treatment. And of course, these medications must be aligned with a lot of what we have just spoken about treatment. You know, we need to educate people. You know, we need to educate families, yes. We need to educate the patients and the, and the clients themselves because a lot of addicts come in knowing a lot about addiction in terms of using, but not a lot about addiction in terms of recovery. You know, what are we fighting? You can't fight what you don't know. So education is something that is, you must absolutely provide. You know, and the more I've been doing this, and I, as I say, for a long time, that's the one thing that people don't understand. You know, they think they know everything about addiction because they lived it, but they don't. I mean, and they say, oh my God, I didn't realize it was causing this. I didn't realize it was causing that. I didn't realize these things were all connected. I didn't realize that my thinking was so affected, that my emotions were so out of whack, that my behavior was so incredibly inappropriate, right? Every addict affects five to seven people in their lives at minimum. You know? And that's what we have to remember. It does. We do. You know? and we have to get help to make those changes. And change takes time. So those are, are two of the medications that are offered in terms of opioid. Um, also, there is Sublocade, which is an injectable form as well, of um, a long-acting extended release for uh, buprenorphine. Again, it's not available everywhere, and it's not for everyone. Um, again, expense aside. Um, but again, if we could get people to get injectables, I think it would make it a lot easier for them. But again, the expense is, is the part. So we have to keep putting pressure into agencies and into our, our lawmakers to make things more available for treatment. You know, we have these big settlements in the opioid, and this is where some of this money has to go, you know, to the actual treatment. Let's get people treated in the door, to give them a chance to make some choices. Yay! Yay is right. I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. And now I'm going to turn it back to my sheet. Okay, so I'm going to talk with you a little bit about those um, medications that are used for individuals who are dealing with alcohol addiction. Now, um, you just heard Ms. Kathy talk about the um, naltrexone and the Vivitrol. Those medications can also be used to assist individuals who are dealing with um, alcohol use disorder as well. So um, some of the things that you have to be careful of, as she stated before, is if you're um, using these medications, you really want to make sure that you are seeking these treatments um, under the care of a healthcare professional. You want to make sure that you know exactly um, what these medications are doing and what you need to do to maintain these treatments because oftentimes, um, like you said, um, we said earlier, individuals can tend to use these as a, um, sorry guys, to continue using these substances um, to address their addictions instead of um, the medication treatment that they need. Um, the other medication is a camprosite, which you may know as Campril. It is a medication that helps to reduce um, cravings. Now, some of the benefits to Campril is that many individuals find this to be very effective in helping them with um, reducing the cravings of alcohol. Some of 
the um, negatives to that is that this medication has to be taken three times a day. So oftentimes individuals may just forget to take it um, or may just stop taking it. And the last medication is um, the so this excuse me this sulforam, which is antabuse. Um, so antabuse is one of those medications that was first used with alcohol addiction and was approved by the FDA. Um, this medication is is a deterrent, and so it deters individuals from using alcohol. If you drink alcohol and use this medication, there are some very negative side effects such as vomiting, nausea, and um, chest pains. So some of the um, benefits to this is that it's a very strong deterrent. And because of those negative side effects, a lot of individuals who use this typically do follow through because they don't want to experience those. Um, some of the cons is that patients can simply just stop taking them, as well as when using the antabuse medication, if you use other products that may have alcohol in them, such as cologne or perfume, and you're hypersensitive, it could have an adverse um, effect on you. Um, antabuse can help stop you it helps to stop break down the process that results in um, the response that you get from the negative effects of alcohol. These medication, well, this medication also um, will cause issues in your liver, in your kidney, and may even result in death. So you really have to be careful with this medication as well as it may leave a metallic taste in your mouth. So those are the medications that are helpful in assisting individuals who are dealing with um, alcohol substance use disorder. So the main thing that we want to drive home tonight is that when using these medications, the person needs to have a plan in place. Um, you don't want to just use these and not really be educated and not have the information to know exactly how these medications can help. Um, these medications are not to replace your addiction. They are to assist you in being able to get back to a normal function in life. So the individual or your healthcare professional that may be um, assisting you with this treatment you know, you need to ask those important questions. Um, you need to be your best advocate. You know, we have to be our best advocate and we can't be afraid to ask the questions that we need to ask to make sure that we're getting the care that we need. So um, these treatments save lives. And as I said earlier, that is what we want to do. We want to save lives, we want to give individual options to be able to function better and regain employment and build back relationships, um, get housing. And that's what these medications can do. They can assist the person with being able to function at the best of their ability um, with the help of treatments like I, um, IOP, which is what we do. You know, these individuals need to have an IOP plan in place. Um, you know, options of going to therapy, as well as going to AA meetings, NA meetings. All of those need to be um, in conjunction with using these medications in order for them to be most successful with the individual. So thank you guys. I want to address real quick, which we're going to go back and forth. Um, I'm going to address nicotine very quickly. Um, nicotine use disorder. How many of you have smoked cigarettes and or used nicotine in any way, shape, or form? Yeah. How many still do? Okay. So you want to maybe think about these things because this is, I know, for my own self, as uh, I have had my last cigarette on November 1st, 1997. Thank God, because I smoked two and a half packs a day. And um, I am also a recovering cancer survivor. 
So I'll, I'll tell you that because all these things do matter, okay? And sometimes we don't see the initial effects of nicotine right away. We see it later on down the road. And nicotine obviously is a phenomenal addiction problem that we have in our country. And a lot of times in recovery from other substances, people come into recovery and say, I'm not ready to do that yet. I was one of those. I'm not ready to do that yet. I need to keep smoking because uh, smoking al allowed me to use the cigarette instead of dealing with my emotions. And one day somebody in recovery said to me, when are you gonna quit that? You know, when are you gonna get really taking care of yourself? Because you're killing yourself. You know, how many times you can get pneumonia? How many times you can get bronchitis? How many times, yeah, all right, okay. And I said, yeah, you're right. So it took about 16 times to try uh, different things to stop smoking. And so some of the things that we do and some of the medications that are available today weren't always there then. I did a lot of the, you know, I went to hypnotist and bruised my hand thing, you know, <laughs> I almost cut my arm off, you know, snapping the rubber band, but um, it didn't really work. So some of the medications that are available are pretty, pretty uh, effective. Uh, Shantex is one of them, you may have heard of it, and some people do it and it's very effective. They can take it for a period of time while they're still smoking, and you begin to lose the craving for the nicotine. It's because, because smoking and nicotine are one of the addictions that are reinforced multiple times. In my case, it was 50 to 60 times a day. That's how much I smoked. <laughs> so however much you smoke or how many times you dip or how many times you put, that's how much you're reinforcing it all the time. So with these medications, they help you while you're still using. It changes the taste in your mouth. It you know, makes you lose the craving for it, for the most part. And people find that they are able to stop smoking. It's effective in 80% of the cases that people use Shantex. That's pretty good, a pretty good medication. But not everyone can tolerate it, okay? Because everybody can't take everything, right? All medications aren't meant for everybody. We all have hypersensitivities to different things. So the downside to Shantex is that for some people, it does have a, a really harsh effect on some people's gastrointestinal uh, areas in their stomachs, okay? It also, in, in some cases, causes severe depression for some people, believe it or not. And um, while it will help with, with uh, cravings, it will not help with nicotine withdrawal, okay? So you're gonna have to go through that one way or another. And most of us don't like that. Um, Again, uh, there are uh, other things that, there have been some people who say they ended up in, in hospitals because of um, psychosis with it as well. I, I imagine it probably had more to do with not sleeping, but you know, again, there's no direct causation on that. But it is a medication that for some people is very beneficial. Um, I think Zyban is another one. Some people know it as well, Butrin. It's from the same family and it's a little slightly different. We use Zyban for not smoking more, more often than not. Again, helps with the cravings doesn't help with the withdrawal as much, and it helps people to kind of lose the desire to use. Obviously, it has an effect on the dopamine system, and that's why um, it also has an effect on a couple of other systems in there on serotonin. So um, it helps people in the bigger picture to stay off the cigarettes, and so it is an effective treatment. Again, I don't have as many statistics on that one way or another, um, because I didn't look it up that way, sorry. Um, but I do know that a lot of people do use it and are effective. The another thing that was brought up more recently was, uh, well, in the last 15 years, at least 20 years, nicotine patches. You know, the, the bonus side to that is a lot of the quit uh, programs that are available, give them out free, at least in the beginning of the year when they still have money. Um, and so they can be gotten through uh, agencies and, and assisting programs that will help you to quit along with support. So that's a good thing. You can get the generics. They're not as expensive as the brand names. Um, you can use them to wean down, so you can sometimes work with the strength and cut them in half, right? Work with your doctor on that if you're going to do that. The downside to any nicotine patch is the possibility of an overdose, right? So we don't wanna put the patch on and smoke because we can have a nicotine overdose which could cause cardiac events, right? We don't want that and death. So that's the downside to using the nicotine patch, okay? Um, my personal choice was the nicotine patch and it did work me, but that's just me. And then there's vaping, which initially in e-cigarettes was intended to stop smoking when it first came out, before all the flavors and the colors and the, you know, appeal to uh, people who shouldn't be using it anyway came around. Um, the initial idea was you're going to use this smokeless, right, e-cigarette, and you're going to stop smoking. 
and then we're going to use a vape where we're going to allow you to put so much nicotine in and bring it down. Well, that didn't really happen, did it? So <laughs> I see a lot of people started with vaping. They didn't even smoke. Now they're vaping, and they can't stop vaping. So <laughs> that's kind of like a crazy thing. And there's a lot of dangers to it. There are a lot of downsides to vaping, and I'm going to say that. Okay? Um, there it would be, be more beneficial if people used it as it was intended, but because they don't. The downsides to this is that we are using a plastic that we heat, and heated plastic in our lungs is not the best thing in the world. Or we're inhaling a steamed product into our lungs, which also is not good. So we, as a consequence of this, we are having a lot of people, young people, enter hospitals with lung issues, breathing problems in their 20s and 30s that may not be reversible. So I say this, uh, we need to use a lot of caution with, with something of that nature of vaping, um, you know, making sure that if, if that's something you think you're doing because you're going to quit, you really have to work with a program, get support. You know, with all these things we talk about with addiction, addiction isn't something you do by yourself. You're not gonna treat it by yourself. You're not gonna just take a med medication and go home. It doesn't work that way, you know? And if you don't even take medications, you don't just, enter a hospital, go home, read a book, and say, oh, now I got this, I got self-help. If, if you could have, you would have. We all would have. We're gonna need support. And, and recovery requires support. And we need to support each other, no matter what avenue of recovery we take. What avenue? We're here to help each other, in the big picture here. This is it, folks, right? Whether you're in recovery or just in the world at large, at the end of the day, we're all looking for the same thing. We're all looking for peace of mind, serenity some sort of joy, you know? And the only way we get that is when we encourage each other. And that's what this is really about. We want to save lives, we want people to come into recovery, we want people to get better at their pace, whatever that is, whether it's medications for mental health, whether it's medications for addiction, it doesn't matter. Get what you need so that you can live your life. Make your choices, reach your goals. Accomplish what you want. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna close for tonight. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We'd like to thank all of our sponsors again and all our speakers tonight. And don't forget that tomorrow, uh, next week, uh, next Thursday night, same thing: dinner and speakers. And uh, next week is a great opportunity to come support the students. Matter of fact, don't hurt my feelings if you come and listen to the students and leave before my part. But come support the students. It would be great to, uh, to have them have the support when they're telling their stories, some of them for the very first time. And so uh, let's end tonight with one more round of applause for all of our sponsors. Go to the car and get your shoes on. Jackson shoes.